Good afternoon. I'm Eric Bustos, Chair of the Future Forum Board. And on behalf of the Future Forum, thank you all for joining us for a conversation on motherhood, work, and the pandemic. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, about three and a half million moms of school-aged children shifted out of active work in April 2020, moving into paid or unpaid leave, losing their jobs, or leaving the labor force completely. Today, we'll talk about the struggle of Texas mothers during the pandemic and what might change. Uh, the LBJ Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals of different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss local, statewide, and national topics that affect us today. Our goal is to create a civil, informed, and bipartisan discussions. The Future Forum events are made possible by our incredible members and sponsors, including the Downtown Austin Alliance, Carbach Buring, and Joe Cook's Catering. There will be an opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the conversation. You're able to type questions in the Q&A box throughout the conversation, and we'll address as many as we can at the end. And now I'll turn it over to our moderator, Abby Johnston, Deputy, Deputy Editor of the 19th, to lead our discussion. Thanks so much, Eric, and thank you very, very much for having me. I'm very excited about our conversation today. Uh, which is a topic that is really close to my heart at the 19th. We are a news site uh, that launched last August in the middle of the pandemic that is focusing on gender politics and policy. And so the ways that the pandemic has impacted women, impacted mothers specifically, something that we report on a lot. And I'm very excited to have this group of panelists here to discuss that with us. So I'd like to introduce them. Uh, we have Dr. Nazgul Bagri, who is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and Geography at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She is author of a recent study on COVID-19's impact on working mothers of color. Dr. Bagri is also a proud recipient of the 2017 President's Distinguished Teaching Excellence Achievement Award at UTSA. So thank you so much for being here with us today, Nazgul. Our next panelist is Katherine Goldstein. She's the creator and host of the critically acclaimed reported podcast, The Double Shift, which is about challenging the status quo of motherhood. Uh, she's an award-winning journalist, a Harvard Neiman Fellow. And she's extensively quoted as an expert in issues facing working mothers in the New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic, and on WNYC and NPR. So thank you very much, Katherine, for being here. And then finally, we have Dr. Elizabeth Gregory, who directs the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program and the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality at the University of Houston, which has just published its 2021 annual update on Houston and Harris County gender and sexuality data, as well as on the ongoing pandemic gender snapshot. So thank you very much. I'm excited to dive in. We have a lot to talk about. Um, I just wanted to kind of set the stage here because I'm sure that not everyone thinks about all of this quite as much as we might. Um, but, you know, the pandemic has hit working women in many ways. This is our first women's recession in recent memory. Um, and internally at the 19th, we sometimes call it the she session. Um, but women felt the brunt of the econo economic impact when businesses began to close because of the pandemic. And even as things have become to stabilize or began to stabilize, we're not seeing that women have recovered jobs in the same way that men have. And a big part of that is child care, its availability, its affordability, and what we still expect from mothers in terms of the equal distribution of labor in the household and unpaid labor. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about how we got to this place where child care was such a problem in the United States. And then for Nazgul and Elizabeth in particular, what that has looked like in Texas specifically, because I know that we have a lens on San Antonio and Houston. Um, so Catherine, is, as, the, as the North Carolina outsider, I'd love to start with you and then we can kind of zero in on Texas. The, you know, so most of what we are seeing in, in terms of the fallout from the pandemic are not new problems, they're just existing problems that have been really exacerbated. So um, basically childcare in America was a highly privatized, expensive, unstable industry um, that relied, that was uh, largely unsubsidized, um, relied on high cost for families, paying low wages for uh, workers and mostly in workers of color, um, women of color were largely staffed those industries. 
a huge percentage of childcare workers lit, who work full-time live in poverty. It was a very, very broken industry. And so a stress like the pandemic with additional cost closures, um, safety concerns have forced so many um, child care centers out of business. So from a national perspective, you know, our child care, um, our child care infrastructure was terrible before the pandemic, and now it has been stress tested and it has collapsed. So there is really not going to be any kind of economic recovery until our child care system is really invested in and built back up. And so what's been exciting for me, I mean, it's it's bittersweet with because part of what, you know, my work is focusing on a lot of these issues over time. And, you know, for the first time you hear people like the Fed chair talking about, you know, child care as an important part of the economy, which is like brand new as part of a national discussion, which is which is it's sad that it's taken taken it to to this point to to have that conversation, but because these uh, issues are now going to affect men and they're going to affect the economy, we're starting to um, people are starting to seriously consider much more comprehensive public policy solutions, including um, a, a couple of initiatives from the Biden administration that are now on the table. Nazgul, can you talk a little bit about about that question, and then also tell us a little bit about you know, what you were finding in your research and looking at women in Austin and San Antonio area? Uh, I want to start uh, my answer with this uh, quote from Helen uh, Peterson. She says, other countries have social safety nets. The U.S. has women. So as uh, Catherine was suggesting, our childcare uh, system is was already broken. And in the state of Texas, a majority of those co-workers are going to be women. Uh, almost 80% of uh, workers in childcare in the state of Texas are women, and uh, more than half of them are going to be immigrants, women of um, non-white women, perhaps, uh, and either first or second generation of immigrants. So while we were talking, um, uh, with a lot of women's mothers, uh, with one of my students who is actually attending here, Joshua Yates, uh, during our uh, online ethnographic, we found out that some of the child, child care uh, centers actually um, really put their workers in a really bad situation. They gave them two choices, which were both bad. One, you can go ahead and lose your job and collect unemployment. The other one was basically work for more than 60 hours to meet the needs, the increased needs of childcare. And that happened in the childcare that my own daughter is going. And a lot of those teachers had to work 60 hours. So as Catherine said, these... Um, problems were existing and the pandemic, like any other uh, societal uh, problems, have uh, exaggerated them. They brought them to the surface so we can see what's going on. And you're right, they have been telling us if we don't get the kids uh, back to school or the daycare, we are not going to go back to the economy. Uh, I have a lot of more uh, stories from these mothers uh, from that uh, online ethnographic, but I'm going to allow uh, Elizabeth to reflect on that and we can come back to women's stories whenever you're ready. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. The dynamic um, that I, I agree with everyone, it's always been a problem. It's highlighting the problem that was already there. It was already having an economic impact, but we assumed that economic impact. And this is the opportunity now to be transformative or not, right? So that's the challenge that we have and that a lot of the Biden uh, gestures, the ARP and possibly the uh, American Family Plan, if that is passed, are raising these issues because they do have feminist economists in their offices, right? They're running uh, a lot of this discussion. So um, it's all, it all fits together, right? So you have women making really low wages all along, uh, getting limited childcare. Um, and part of the reason that they're making low wages is because they have limited childcare. Uh, and 
employers can anticipate that they will be unreliable workers. So this is true in Texas and it's true around the country. So the term that I like is school work synchrony. That's what we need, right? If we don't have school work synchrony, then women can't be reliable workers and employers will not invest in them. Even if they don't actually have children, they might. So why would an employer invest in a female or you know, with the raises or promotions and because women weren't rising, weren't doing, you know, moving up at the same rates, it was only a trickle up, um, they never got into a position where they could create policies that would allow them to move up at a greater rate. <laughs> so it's been this sort of um, vicious circle or cycle uh, where it's been self-defeating for decades. So we finally have a moment, like right before the pandemic, where we did have high levels of female employment. We did have women getting elected at higher rates. We're at 25% in the Congress or so, and in the Texas legislature. Um, so you're having women move into policymaking roles and uh, people like Heather Boucher and other uh, economists working for um, uh, the um, around the American family plan and things like that are saying, we need to make this investment. So this is the opportunity that uh, we as a state and we as a nation have to uh, imagine, well, not just how do we get back to where we were before, but how, if we actually did invest in childcare and an in infrastructure, would that actually boost the economy and make a, a kind of transformative situation in which people could participate in very different ways. And um, that includes both women uh, and their children because, um, you know, about a third, a little more than a quarter, I guess 20, 29% in Houston of moms are single moms um, and their median income is 35,000. So they're not necessarily in poverty, but they are not, they are struggling. Um, and so are their children. So, uh, and that's true, you know, among partnered moms as well. So you have uh, an effect that's not just on the female workforce, but also on the impoverished children uh, who are also workforce of the future. So these are all workforce issues that could be uh, catalyzed in a very positive way um, if we take this opportunity. I want to, we'll, we'll get back to the childcare industry and some of the things that, because I think Elizabeth, like you said, we have an opportunity now with a lot of the big investments that, um, that we're starting to see from the Biden administration. But uh, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about the individual impacts on moms and the opportunities that, uh, that we're going to see taken away because they had to step back um, in many cases from work. So, you know, like I mentioned before, we're starting to see women re-enter the workforce. Um, it's still not a possibility for many. And then still others might have chosen not to re-enter the workforce for other reasons after the pandemic and a lot of them relating to childcare. Uh, and it's it's a little maybe hard to put a number on this, but we we basically we've seen decades of progress for equity in the workforce for women erased by all of this. And so I'm, I'm curious from y'all's perspectives, like what are some of the long-term impacts that we might expect to see from this giant exodus of women uh, and mothers in particular from the workforce? And Catherine, we'll, we'll start with you there. Um, I think that, you know, we, we, we don't have a clear, um, you know, we, we've never, no one alive basically has lived through an experience like this. So we don't have a, an exact blueprint for what's gonna happen. But what we can learn is from what happens when women um, take time out of the workforce to care for children in the before times that were not pandemic related. So what that is, I think the best blueprint for us to understand what could happen without sort of significant um, public policy and sort of concerted effort in the private sector as well. So basically, um, uh, it, research has found it is very hard for mothers, even um, when they take short amounts of time out of the workforce, to um, get back in at the same level that they were. It, um, you know, a lot of times I hear people talking about these conversations. Well, it's like, oh, I only made, you know, a little bit more than the cost of childcare, so it wasn't worth it. 
Um, but a lot of times those are very sort of, and again, this isn't a judgment on any one's personal individual decision because these are such difficult dis- decisions. But a lot of times that that um, making that calculation actually obscures other costs. So for example, if you decide because your salary is not very high and so you want to leave the workforce because you don't want to devote um, most of your salary to childcare, that doesn't account for the retirement savings that you might be getting from that job or social security or professional advancement of working in that field for a number of years that allow you to reach new levels and earn more. So um, so all of that is to say is that um, it, it is even, you know, even if the economy recovers, um, also because of systemic bias against mothers, we may, it may be very, very hard for people to sort of reclaim, like pretend this didn't happen in terms of their career and their earnings. And that, as Elizabeth was mentioning, is also going to affect who runs companies, who runs for office, who has power in this country, because money is also very uh, equivalent to power in this country. So um, economic power has a huge, you know, is hugely influential in, in, you know, how we shape our society. So that's sort of the, the kind of, the, the, the guide is not, you know, the, the path forward, if, if we treat mothers, like we've, we've have historically treated mothers, it's going to be a long road to getting back without some really significant cultural and public policy investments. Nazgul. Same question. Um, yeah, um, I want to uh, focus on a little bit, give attention to education. UN uh, back a few months ago uh, published uh, their report on the status of women in rural uh, places in developing countries. And uh, it seems that's what they usually focus. Unfortunately, they uh, don't recognize sometimes in their uh, reports that women are coming in all colors and ages and with different choices in their life. As Catherine was saying, we all we don't all have similar choices to make, right? Um, so many of these uh, girls and young women had to quit their education during the pandemic to take care of their younger siblings or their even young children. So education being how we get to go to the, get equipped with the skills to get those higher end or higher paid jobs was interrupted, uh, double the rate for men based on the UN report. So that's something to consider. Women are not just losing their job or are being forced to make really difficult choices to leave their job and stay at home with their kids, they also have to quit educating themselves, either at like higher uh, education or even element like a high school education, just come back home. And it's really hard, as Catherine was saying, we don't get uh, to jump back when we left. When you, like uh, Mariam is a computer engineer, we talked in Austin, and she and her husband are both engineer, computer engineer. She gave birth to her daughter uh, in uh, last June and she was making similar to her husband, but uh, because there weren't any daycare availability, she sacrificed. She basically was forced to sacrifice to quit her job. And by the time she's ready to go back, Mariam is not going to make the same amount of money that her husband is making. So this interruption is going to, as uh, Katrin was saying, very unexpected result uh, on women uh, power and economic power. Uh, I also want to mention that 2020, kind of jumping on what uh, Elizabeth was uh, talking about, women being empowered before the pandemic, 2020 was uh, the 25th anniversary of the Beijing platform for gender equality. So it was supposed to be a very, very exciting year for us as women to celebrate. And guess what happened? We are pushed back again. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm all ears to hear what Elizabeth think about that. Oh, it was also the suffrage centennial. Uh, so that was a big <clears throat> point of discussion. And one thing we discovered was that in Houston, uh, because of the close proximity of August to November, 
and registration had already closed for the people who wanted to vote had to pay a poll tax and they had to pay it by January. They waived the poll tax and 14,000 men voted and 14,000 women voted and 6,000 of them were African-American in Houston because of the waiving of the poll tax. So it was just a sort of uh, hugely informational um, uh, moment. Um, and that did not occur again when the poll tax was reinstated uh, shortly thereafter. I don't know if I'm still um, being heard uh, because you are all frozen there for a moment. Can you hear me? But the other point that I wanted to note uh, also was the um, effect which people have hinted at around issues of status. So for instance, in that couple that you mentioned, where you have uh, two people making the same wage uh, because the decision was made and we can say that couple made a decision, but also th that decision was helped by the infrastructure set up that she would stay home. Another alternative would have been for her to stay home for three months or something or some set of some period of time and for him to stay home too. That would have been an option and it is rarely discussed in our, in our universe. Um, but that's also part of why women are viewed as unreliable workers is because it's expected that they will do this work. And if you're going to change things, you actually have to not just have women also do paid work, but also have men do homework. So you have to have, you can't just say, okay, women will do them both. <laughs> that doesn't happen, it doesn't work. I mean, or you get the burnout that we're currently having. But what you get as a result of that status change, not to speak to this couple at all, uh, but there, you know, there are various effects of status change. And one uh, in the wider world is, um, one of dependency. So if you're if you're making uh, enough money to, let's just put this in uh, sort of stark terms. If you're making enough money that you could leave if the situation became violent or unpleasant, then the likelihood that you will that the situation will become violent goes down. But if you are making less and you are dependent that creates a kind of vulnerability that may in itself lead to violence that would not otherwise occur. So um, what we did see a rise in pandemic uh, violence, you know, which was variously registered because sometimes you see, oh, there's a rise in calls and that's a sign, but also sometimes a decline in calls will be a sign that people are locked in with their abuser and that kind of thing. So um, one of the takeaways, if you do see women losing uh, status and economic uh, position is you'll see an overall rise in, uh, in domestic violence um, just because it's an effect of dependency. Um, and it, it plays out in very different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be direct violence, right? It can be other kinds of status issues within relationships. And as women get more power, then um, we see, you know, you know, equal power, that would be the goal. <laughs> Not more power than others, right? But an equitable voice in uh, society, then you'll see things change about the way um, decisions around um, all the infrastructure and about who does care work. If I may, uh, Abby, um... Uh, Elizabeth, you're absolutely right about the status. And in this case, in this couple, uh, Miriam decided to breastfeed, uh, breastfeed her. Uh, so that it's the nature that enforced her to be, you know, later on, perhaps you can equally or some sort of, um, I always have problem with the equal. I don't know how equal the partners can be uh, really, really equally. But in this case, she was like, not just forced by the economy and just the, it's, it was also by the nature. She had to stay there and she knew, and as you said, the violence is going to be just the impact of that um, uh, economic and status imbalance. She also was suffering from mental health, keep questioning herself. I got my master what's going on i'm not uh, going uh, up the careers uh, ladder so it was like a really really hard challenging situation with her and she and i kept going back and forth about women's right and the equality as a mother as a new mother yeah so i would say 
that's again an infrastructure issue, right? There's you don't have to because breastfeeding cannot be done by men, uh, but but there are other ways to divide time, right? So uh, if you had longer leaves, then you could say uh, at a certain point, a woman might start pumping and then that might uh, be balanced out by uh, the dad staying home. And there is a, a, a sense that if that is enforced, um, because uh, otherwise they would lose a certain amount of weight of, um, of leave overall, you know, if there's a one year leave and it has to be divided six months, six months or something like that. Uh, some countries have tried those. Um, it it does introduce the male parent to care work in a more direct way, uh, and it makes it something. You know, I was impressed by story. There were a number of journalistic stories about how, well, my husband lost his job uh, in the pandemic, and he was going to stay home with the kids. But after three days, he couldn't take it, so I quit my job. And I was like, what? <laughs> three days? Uh, you know, but this was. Somehow people are not used to this idea of sharing care and and we as a society have to figure out ways to and you know give people that experience because it's actually quite a pleasant experience in many respects and uh, men would enjoy it if if only they knew if only if it were compensated in, in with respect. Uh, Elizabeth, I think that is a great point. And I, I've also seen some research that, you know, men who take real paternity leave are more involved in their kids caregiving up to age six. Like they, you know, they check in with them over time. And so it's also about those competencies. So a lot of times it starts at the beginning. If men don't have paternity leave, don't take paternity leave, they don't feel comfortable doing this care work. And it creates these lifetimes of imbalances that then also have these economic ramifications as well. So yeah, I mean, some one thing I always say is the most feminist thing a man can do is take his fully allotted paternity leave. And that is really part of the overall picture of, you know, not only gender equity in the home, but gender equity in the workplace. And like for men to understand how how hard care work can be and how valuable it is, creates all sorts of different dynamics in our society rather than, you know, the idea that any man who you hire is going to be a better worker because they're not going to have care responsibilities. Like that's part of, you know, changing those dynamics in the home also changes those dynamics in the workplace. Uh, may I, uh, yeah, before we go, I think it's very important, the feminization of the care. It's a systematic societal level change we need, you know, uh, another example of my own life is that my husband did have uh, uh, the leave, but he was saying, and he did take uh, the leave uh, for parenthood leave, but many of his male colleagues didn't. So as you were saying, Catherine, being, it's a systematic ideological uh, problem we have in the US and I'm sure many, in <laughs> many other uh, countries we have that that needs to be changed. We need to be educating about the, um, the ethics of the care and the feminization of the care in this country. Like going back to what we have been finding, 82% of the nurses in the state of Texas are women. So again, you see that feminization of care in, in a, a lot of industry is repeating. And also care, a studies has shown that care for elderly parents is usually done by the daughters, even they are outside the home country. There was an excellent studies of Nepalese, a graduate student who went to uh, Japan and uh, study, and the study shows that the female graduate studies were checking on their parents much more than the male graduate students. So it's just a feminization of the care and how we value care. Yes, we call them heroes, but the, at the end of the day, we don't even pay them as much as the, you know, we call them heroes. But that's exactly what gender is. Gender is a work assignment system and the work that women are assigned is the work of care. And it also has a pay scale, which is zero. <laughs> um, so, so that's basically what we're fighting as we work to, uh, to rethink um, work assignment and to realize you know, that the, the job of being a human being has been transformed you know, just in terms of our lifespans, just uh, we don't have as many children, so you don't really need to spend your whole life 
working in that, and so that kind of um, specialization of care doesn't make sense in the same way. So as an economy, and uh, we even, you know, without asking big questions about the larger assumptions about our economy, which is essentially exploitative and assumes that somebody will be doing a lot of work for very little, uh, not just women. Um, but even apart from that, uh, we have to rethink it because it doesn't make sense. And we're not really utilizing the perspectives of all of the potential market makers, you know, and, and, and the idea that people should be poor and therefore they'll do multiple jobs for very little is a sort of desperation economy is is a very mean way of running your economy, but it also sort of ignores the idea, well, if people had money in their pockets, they would be spending it. You know, they'd be going to your business. It's not just that you're giving money to them and they're sitting on it. They're taking it and, you know, what they call uh, consumption multipliers, right? They, they go out and they spend it uh, in a lot of other places, which takes us back to this, well, what happens with the $300 going away over the summer in our economy, how much of that is gonna cause people to go back to work and how much of it is just gonna impoverish mothers who are stuck without childcare access. So, you know. Well, the, the childcare tax credit does start this summer. I will be getting $900 a month for my three children, six and under. So um, I think that's actually a really transformative. We, we don't really know the effects because it hasn't gone into effect yet, but this is a potentially transformative policy that if people aren't aware, um, for one year, families, uh, most most American families, if you earn under one hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, will be getting between two hundred fifty and three hundred thousand. Uh, sorry, not thousand, two hundred fifty or three hundred dollars a month cash to help you offset childcare expenses. Um, and actually, people up to four hundred thousand dollars will also be getting a benefit as well. So it's basically, it's a hugely interesting new economic experiment in America that I'm personally excited to benefit from. And I think we'll have a huge economic, positive economic benefits as well uh, for many, many others. And the big thing with, with the child care tax credit too, is that it's finally reaching the, the poorest families out there. You know, that's been a, a, a loophole for a long time is that the people who are not paying taxes are not getting this child care tax credit and that's going to be a big change which there's big lofty goals from the administration that say that it's going to lift i mean it is some really huge percentage of children out of poverty we don't really know how that's going to bear out yet but um it, it is a really this is a it's a big step it's a big step and speaking of big steps by the administration uh i'd, I'd like to talk about the american rescue plan for a little bit you know, we've seen we've seen a number of uh, economic stimulus packages uh, where money has been earmarked for child the childcare industry in particular. Um, the American Rescue Plan is the biggest one so far. They they've put thirty nine billion dollars toward the childcare system that will be distributed to states. Um, then states will turn around and figure out it's a one time investment. Uh, they will figure out what they would like to use. On. The administration has issued guidance, um, but it, it is mostly up to the states to figure out how to distribute those funds. Uh, we're seeing some really interesting things across the United States in terms of like how, how people have started to use previous uh, stimulus dollars towards child care industries. But I'm curious uh, if, if y'all can talk about anything interesting that you've seen in terms of how those investments are being used, how people are talking about how the investment should be used. Um, either in, in Texas or in, in other states that we might look at too as a, a model. And um, now as well as, oh, Elizabeth, I can start with you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine, go ahead. I had a, a, a conversation with someone who indicated that one option would be a, chair, a child care voucher that could be taken to any provider um, that would allow people to make their own choices as opposed to being uh, told to go to one or another um, kind of provider. So that was an, that was an interesting um, consideration that was being made because I, I states, counties, cities, ISDs are all uh, school districts are all having to make these decisions really fast and try to be innovative. So they need input from people around those um, and making the I think there is discussion around making the child care credit. Uh, permanent over the long term, we were calculating there are about uh, th 
3 million poor children in Texas who previously were not eligible for the tax credit because their family didn't, didn't file taxes. So it was only people who filed taxes who were eligible. So the people who needed it most were not being served. So now they are. Um, so they'll be getting this access. And that's, um, in addition, all the other children will be also seeing a boost who, you know, who were previously getting some, their families were getting some, uh, we're getting, I think, like $2,000 a month. They'll now be getting the $3,000 to $3,600, not per month, per year, um, per child. So that's that's also a huge boon to the uh, economy of Texas, right? So, and Texas has been in this uh, complicated, you have a lot of loss of women's jobs, but there's also a turn down in the oil and gas. So that's a lot of men's jobs as well. Um, so there's been a sort of, it's different from state to state. But um, yeah, childcare vouchers and expanded care are being discussed everywhere, I imagine. Nazgul, do you have anything to add to that? Um, perhaps on privatizing uh, the childcare, uh, having some more options uh, for uh, parents to choose. Right now, uh, we have like a lack of enough childcare in Austin, where I live. Perhaps having more like public school or public options for um, mothers or for parents would be something. But I never thought of the child uh, voucher. That sounds like a great idea, Elizabeth. It was not mine. But the other thing that I should mention, though, um, but it was, I liked it. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to carry it forward. Uh, that I should mention about Texas is we have a huge undocumented population who frequently do not have access to benefits. So then you have this whole other issue of poverty that may not be addressed by uh, even a tax uh, credit. So the, the other side of it is regularizing immigration, which is you know, it has a direct impact on children and women who are uh, in tech in Houston, uh, Hispanic women are living in poverty, 21% um, where Hispanic men, 11%. So that's huge. And it must be in some dimension related to uh, parenthood. So um, there are a lot of parts of our economy that we don't know about, or we don't care to know about. Uh, and that's true for Texas, it's true for other parts of the country too. But part of doing this kind of feminist analysis of women's participation would also be doing an actual analysis of how the economy works and what's good and bad about that. You know, not just assume that the old way is the way we have to move forward, um, but be innovative across the board. Uh, the only thing I would jump in to add is that I, I haven't I haven't heard of I think there's a lot that's still being figured out about these plans. But you know, one of the the sort of thought provocations that I would want to put out there, and I would want you know people policymakers to be thinking about, and and families to be thinking about, like why as a society do we believe that starting at age five kids are entitled to a free education, but below five you are on your own like that there should be, you know, there are some are existing small subsidies for certain uh, groups, but basically, you know, the idea that everything below five is privatized, everything above five, you know, again, public, the public school system, there's plenty, we could have a whole nother conversation about different problems and equities there. But as a society, we've agreed that public schools should exist and that there is some government funding for that. So um, really challenging, like, why do we think it's okay for there to be no support for people who have children under five. A lot of that has to do with our, uh, our ambivalence about mothers in the workforce. A lot of this has to do with reinforcement of traditional gender roles. Um, but just assuming that it's okay for this to be a private, you know, <laughs> that raising children and having children is, you know, a personal hobby akin to windsurfing or something that you should just feel, you know, if you want to invest all that money in, that's up to you, um, is, you know, it's not working as we're seeing from the terrible birth rate. Like we're basically at a, like, you know, society is not going to continue to function if we treat parents like how we're treating them. <laughs> so um, it's, it, it's the question is not just about whether or not we're helping parents. The question is ultimately existential about why we're why we think about these things in this way. 
Again, may I connect what Catherine said to what Elizabeth earlier uh, called this vicious cycle, right? We don't value those kids' education before five, and those kids are going to uh, stay behind and they're going to continue being behind. Unfortunately, majority of them are going to be people of color, immigrants, low income. So you see the cycle starts when they're just born, not having access to right education. The mother is coming back and forth from three jobs, doesn't have enough time to spend with her kid, and the education starts way before five-year-old. So we are seeing that lacking behind going uh, forward with that. They, they just fall, unfortunately, in that vicious um, cycle. Now, the attitude seems to be, it's your family, it's your problem, mm -hmm. right? rather than these are the workers of our society. And why? And because we value our, our population, we want to invest in them with, make sure they have good food and health care and a good education. Those would be what you would assume a society would want to give to its people from the beginning, as you say, not just be, when they're five. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and whether or not they, you know, we, we do see all these uh, people who can afford childcare, hey, they started three months. So, you know, the the school work synchrony model would be 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. from age three to age 18. And you don't have to go to school till 6 p.m. if you don't want to, but you have that option. So, you know, you don't have to have your kids in summer school, but you have that option. So, you know, the I calculated it uh, currently in the setup of the school day, children are in school um, during the work hours over the course of their lifetime between zero and 18, 37% of the time. So because of you know all the five, first five years, the three months off every year in the summer, 2.30, they get out of school, and then there are all those Perfect. random days. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> service days. You know, it's like, what? Who do you think is gonna be taking care of these children? If you had a, a fully uh, synchronous program, you'd have hundreds of thousands of extra jobs. Uh, you would be taking people out of dependency, but you'd also be uh, allowing people to like get their homework done before they go home and spend more positive time with their uh, with their families when they get there. You know, there, there are just a lot of ways you could restructure. Um, the school day, and I know that one of the other areas that people are looking at now with the, with the school district money is expanding after school offerings so that they do go from 2.30 to 6. And if you made that available universal, that would be transformative also. And if, you know, it, I don't think they're going to be able to gear up for this summer, but if they start thinking about, you know, how do we offer an enrichment program over the summer that also keeps up with learning loss, you know, undoes that. Um, how positive would that be for millions of people? Because it's not the case that everybody is in camp, you know, over the summer in some idealized universe where they're all out in. See, Elizabeth, what you're talking is exactly the feminist ethics of care, where we are being seen an interconnectedness of our identities. And you, if you are better, I'm going to be better. But that's not, the system is not working. We need women like you, women who believe in this, way of thinking in a policy making, in a decision making level. And that's why I'm keep believing this is a structure. We can like uh, do all of these little things, change these leaders, but we need uh, to get women and men at the same time, change their ideas about this gender relations. And I think the pandemic, you're right. It, it is an opportunity those tax credit, all of these changes that we are making are going to take us, but I think we might need more uh, revolutionary, perhaps, feminist ethics uh, in our society. I'm here for it. it. I'm here for it. I'm here for the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about, you know, that this is an opportunity. Like the pandemic has, has exposed so many of the issues that we had within childcare, within gender roles in the home. Um, you know, the childcare aspect of everything is, is, you know, something that largely we're going to have to trust our state government or federal government to fix. Uh, but within the homes, 
Um, and seeing this unpaid work um, and the distribution of that when it, when it comes to child care, we've talked a lot about how um, care for older family members also usually falls on women. What can be done even within the homes, like smaller conversations, anything to start to correct that? And, and also how do, from your research, from speaking with, with mothers who have gone through this, who have had the burnout, do you think is that shifting? Did the pandemic expose to maybe husbands that there is a real shift that needs to happen here? And also before I let y'all answer that, I'd like to remind people that um, we do wanna leave some time at the end for Q and A's. You can go ahead and start dropping questions in that box and I'll be able to see them. But um, yeah, what, what can we do about all of this? <laughs> I have many, I have many thoughts on this at a very prescient move. Um, uh, in the end of 2019, uh, the double shift, we did a, an entire series on the idea that the revolution begins at home and that we can't see changes in the world until we see changes in our own home lives. And what a, what a, I, I was really excited about that pre pandemic. And I feel like, you know, the pandemic has only further exposed that. I think um, so the, the number one uh, best resource on this topic is a book by my friend Eve Rodsky called Fair Play. And the idea around fair play is that all time is equal and that in a relationship, if someone makes more money, it doesn't mean that their time is inherently more valuable in a relationship. And she has a lot of very concrete ways to think about dividing time in, in partnerships in, in the home. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that, you know, one of the things, I don't think this is, I think, um, you know, for example, in academia, um, uh, this sort of time during the pandemic of like more being at home, like men are publishing at a much higher rate than women because they are not taking on more caregiving. Um, there's the reports about working from home where men like are much more likely to say it has had no negative impact on their productivity where women ha are reporting the opposite. So um, I think that a lot of this you know, again, whatever individual systems we had and supports and outsourcing that white collar women had to sort of skate by fought, have fallen away. And I think that basically, you know, people who, you know, who, uh, you know, have setups in their home, men who have setups in their home where they get more leisure time and they don't, you know, we, maybe we say we want to spend more time with kids, but maybe they don't want to spend more time cleaning the bathroom and folding laundry. Like that's not, they don't find that enjoyable. They're benefiting from that unpaid labor for that someone else is doing. So I think having very, very challenging conversations in our own homes and also, you know, thinking more expansively about you know, why, why are we so committed to the nuclear family as an ideal? Like, that's not how most people, that's not how we've raised families for most of human history. Like, why can we think more expansively about extended families and communities and co-housing and all these different things? So I think it's not only about personal negotiation, but also about how can we, you know, create legal statuses for, you know, families that have more than two parents and all this sort of thing. So um, I'm, I'm totally down for these conversations. And I think, you know, just negotiating who's doing what is really only the beginning of these very, very tough conversations that we need to be having as a society. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Excellent point, Catherine. And I can bring up two stories from uh, these women. Rosa, uh, she is a uh, restaurant worker and she is a single mom of two kids uh, she lives in El Paso and she lives with her mother and the mother is doing that childcare so she as an essential worker can go work in the back of the restaurant so what you're saying exactly matches what we have been hearing from these women uh, remember uh, Mariam in Austin with the same education and a pay uh, a scale at her husband she had those difficult um, uh, conversation with her husband and her husband was like, tell me, let's have a schedule. Let's have items that I do and items you do. So um, maybe perhaps we can uh, have a public education system, Elizabeth. Maybe it is there in other countries that they are happier than us or ranked more happy in uh, the uh, ranking of the cities or countries or right in the board scale. 
what are they doing that they are able to share those unpaid domestic and childcare in a more um, equal way, or at least more enjoyable way, uh, Elizabeth, right? Well, How are they doing it? Some countries do have structures that uh, award uh, leave on a structured basis, right? Where, where you do have a requirement that uh, men and women um, equally participate. Um, there was, I remember a few decades back, I mean, I don't remember literally, but I, I, I have seen that there was um, a discussion of like writing up contracts, right? Where, you know, where mm -hmm. you divide household work. And then this is immediately, it was suggested, it was mocked as, oh, these feminists are they're just too, you know, that's not the way real life is. People don't live by a contract. But why not? I mean, in a, in, a, in a basic way, you can divide up tasks and just not do them if they, if they aren't your tasks. You know, just don't just say, okay, well, they didn't do it. I'm, I, I'll do it. You know, just don't do it. And have that, uh, that difficult uh, dynamic. But I think you can't have it just in the familial situation. You also have to have it reinforced by social structures that indicate that there actually is a uh, positive respect and um, um, endorsement, you know, that people will maybe get paid more for not being productive during the pandemic <laughs> in their academic point system. I don't know, uh, because that shows you were actually doing more, <laughs> right? You were probably doing all that child rearing. Uh, yeah. But where, where you change the, the way things are, um, are recognized. Jumping back to what Elizabeth and Catherine both said, there are several, already several publications about how women academics have not been um, either publishing as much as their male colleagues or being uh, conducting laboratory research. And guess what? It's not just the childcare. We in our uh, universities, the care for graduate students and undergraduate students is definitely uh, feminized, right? We all experience it. We, uh, most of the students come to female professors to get the care, to be heard, to be uh, helped out about something outside the classroom. So that's, again, feminization of the care in all aspects of um, that. And Elizabeth, I would love to see an example of that contract between a partners, how they did it, and are they still together or did they what happened? <laughs> they divorced shortly thereafter. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but that was back in the 60s. I think I can find it and send it to you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's across the board. And uh, it, status uh, is hugely important at every level. And uh, particularly reinforcements for impoverished women um, are, are the, the step that um, is key. But the same dynamic occurs at all at all levels and you know here in our state we have um, other kinds of uh, dynamics of lack of support that we need to rethink uh, right so we have particular problems around um, support for health care support for uh, fair wages and uh, support for reproductive health access, which is also part of a, pro a poverty manufacturing machine. You know, so if you don't have access to birth control and abortion, then you are uh, more likely to be in a, in a cycle of poverty as are your children. And uh, these, these dynamics have to be uh, discussed also as part of uh, a larger um, entity of lack of support. So, uh, or system of lack of support. So as a, as a state, we have particular uh, concerns, but these are echoed throughout the United States. So um, they're, they're parallel. It's a great segue to a question from our audience and you already started to answer this, Elizabeth, but uh, we have a question, what can or should Texas parents ask their lawmakers to do to expand our social safety net, either on a state or city level? to expand the social uh, safety network? Well, there are so many ways. <laughs> um, 
So currently they could stop trying to limit access to uh, uh, reproductive health care and clinics and uh, things like that, or they, they skipped an opportunity to expand the Medicaid uh, option under the Affordable Care Act uh, that was actually offered by a bipartisan set of uh, legislators. Um, and, you know, it's still, it's still time. It could, could happen again, I suppose. Um, uh, as, as was noted, you know, there's such inequitable uh, education system in our state. We rank 42nd in terms of uh, investment in education. And a lot of the, the highly paid jobs here are filled by people from other states where they do invest in education. And Texans don't get the benefit of their own uh, state's economy thriving. So that's uh, another area. Um, you know, there are just so many issues, regularizing wages around immigration, huge issue has to be done in collaboration with the feds. But if you want equity, you have to recognize that, the, that there are huge numbers of workers who are doing, uh, making the, the the workforce, uh, the cost of living lower. Uh, everybody takes that work for granted and then castigates the people at the same time. Um, but there has to be some uh, some real addressing of that. Um, access to free good childcare, uh, fix the criminal justice system. So many ways uh, you could talk to your uh, <laughs> talk to your and they all affect. The, the economy and, and not just the gender roles of women, but also the gender roles of men that are also limiting. Um, Thank you for that. If there's something to add, we, just to note, we only have about two minutes left. Um, I wish we could do this for another 30 minutes, but. <laughs> I, I just wanted to jump on um, Elizabeth listed so many great causes and you know sometimes people can feel overwhelmed like there's so many issues I could possibly get involved with and so you know what I have seen from you know listeners um, the double shift community listeners and stuff and, and heard from other moms especially moms we're stretched really thin we can't take on all these issues but find what your issue is whether it's around your local school board whether it's around universal child care in your county whether it's a specific bill in the legislature and like really get involved in that like you can't fix everything but sort of in, get some friends involved too so you don't feel like you're doing it alone and you know if there's something that really speaks to you find that issue and and stick with it you know and I think that that is how we make change over time it, we can't fix everything in one fell swoop but concerted people making making those um, efforts and really focusing on uh, on these issues you know in an ongoing way does make a difference and if I may uh, just suggest those mothers that Catherine said uh, focus on one specific subject, I would like to see a, a change in a specific policy. How does concretely change that mother's life or her, her children's life? So translate the policy to real life experiences. It's going to change your life in this way and that way with solid facts and numbers. So other women who might not be um, interested in getting politically active can see the result in their own life and be more inclined to join the movement, perhaps. Great advice, everyone. Well, I want to thank all of you again, Nazgul, Catherine, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for being with here being with me here today and thank you so much for inviting us and hosting this panel this is a great discussion obviously a lot to talk about here um, but i loved hearing from all of you thank you for having us thank you very much